Youth activists from around the nation involved in climate change issues are on Capitol Hill today. They're calling for passage of a bill that addresses renewable energy sources, fuel efficiency standards, and other measures. Some of them will speak here before a hearing of the House Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming. It should get underway in just a few minutes. Chaired by Ed Markey of Massachusetts, the ranking Republican is James Sensenbrenner of Wisconsin. We're live on C-SPAN 2. Youth leaders on climate change, the hearing we're showing you here today. We want to tell you about some other programming coming up on the uh, C-SPAN networks. At uh, 10 o'clock, just after Washington Journal, we'll be live at the White House for today's Presidential Medal of Freedom ceremony. Eight recipients, including Liberian President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, former um, Illinois Representative Henry Hyde, and others. That's live at 10 on C-SPAN. Congressional negotiators continue to meet this week, working out compromises on federal spending for 2008. The House Appropriations Committee Chairman David Obey will be at the press club to talk about what's happening and also about his new memoir, Raising Hell for Justice. That'll be live on C-SPAN at 1 Eastern. Also at the press club this afternoon, the Turkish Prime Minister. He's in town for meetings with President Bush, and he'll speak with reporters today answering questions about the situation in his country, live at 3 Eastern on C-SPAN 3. And one more note, tonight on The Communicators, Michael Copps, FCC Commissioner, will talk about his opposition to relaxing media ownership rules that gets underway at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific, right here on C-SPAN 2. And again, we are at the Longworth House Office Building, waiting for the start of this uh, Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming. This was uh, made a new committee that was begun to look into the issue of climate change um, at the start of the 110th Congress. It's chaired by Ed Markey of Massachusetts and the ranking Republican Jim Sensenbrenner of Wisconsin. Youth activists, youth leaders from across the country are here on Capitol Hill, and they will be speaking to the committee today as well as uh, holding a rally on Capitol Hill later today. All right, I realize it is very crowded in here, but if people can just move back a little bit more, if there's extra space next to you in the back, just please just try to fill up space. We got all sorts of people up here, and it's a fire hazard if we block the doors. So please just try to make some room. It is great to see all of you here. Thank you.
The first day of the legislative week on Capitol Hill. We're waiting for this committee to get underway. We'll tell you what the House and Senate are up to today. The House is in at 1230 for general speeches and then legislative business at, uh, at 2. First, the Senate, though, the Farm Bill, the focus of their agenda today. They'll come in for general speeches for an hour or so and begin debate on the, uh, on the Farm Bill which sets agriculture policy for the next five years. It covers areas like nutrition nutrition programs, including food stamps as well. That's on C-SPAN 2 today at 2 o'clock. Now the House. The House comes in at 1230 for general speeches and then for legislative business at 2 o'clock in the House. They have about a dozen bills to, uh, to take up today, including funding for tuberculosis and a bill aimed at protecting the credit ratings of military service members. If you're just joining us, uh, we're taking a live look here at the Longworth House Office Building. We're here for a hearing of the um, Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming. Ed Markey of Massachusetts is the chairman. He's just arrived, taking his seat. They're going to hear from youth leaders, youth activists from across the country about climate issues. Should get underway momentarily. Live here on C-SPAN 2. Good morning. Today, the Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming will receive testimony from five representatives of a youth movement that is demanding to be heard and deserves to be heard, not only just by members of Congress, but by decision makers, young and old, in business, in government, in town meetings, and city halls, and not just in the United States and the developed world but also in developing countries, in Africa and South America and in India and China. It echoes movements of the past, but it is all about the future. This time, young people are standing together as one force asking for action, action from our government that will ensure a clean energy and a healthy climate future. Adults sometimes have a hard time listening to people younger than they, but in this case it is the youth of the world that have the most standing to be heard. When the world science community says that the planet is heating up dangerously as a result of global warming pollution, they are talking about the future of the people in this room. On Saturday and Sunday, over 5,500 student activists and youth leaders, the pulse of a new politics and a new direction, gathered at the University of Maryland to push forth solutions to the real threat of our climate and energy crisis. I am told that it was the largest conference ever held in the United States on climate change. These young people representing every single congressional district are our future, a future that is imperiled by efforts of climate change, 
and energy policies that are built on cheap oil and imported oil. They speak for millions of other young people with the same concerns. In a recent survey conducted in February of 2007, 81 percent of young adults recognize that global warming is real. We as a government and as a nation are faced with a decision. Will we act now to ensure a clean energy and healthy climate future for the prosperity, security and health of future generations? The goal is to cap the world's carbon emissions at levels that will keep temperatures from rising dangerously. The Congress is considering legislation that would accomplish that goal. I am the co-sponsor of legislation that would require the United States to reduce emissions by 80 percent below 1990 levels by 2050, and it is clear to me that anything less than an 80 percent goal for 2050 is compromising the future. When it comes to the future of the children of this world, we cannot afford less. But the Congress needs to be educated about this subject and then educated again and again. That is partly why Speaker Pelosi formed the Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming, because she wanted at least one panel here in Congress to be spending full time on this subject, pressing for action every day of every week. She also demanded that the House pass an energy bill that got us started with dealing with these issues even before we reached the issue of capping carbon, and we haven't done that. In the next six weeks, the House and Senate will take some very key votes on the energy bill, testing whether we have the wisdom to adopt tough new standards for automobiles and buildings and electricity generation and cellulosic ethanol that moves us away from an old energy agenda. If these votes go well, we will have the momentum we need to push ahead on a cap, auction and trade bill that will truly transform our energy world. We cannot do less than pass this energy bill, but we want more, much more, and if we are to stop global warming, we must do it soon. This is our chance and this is our time to fix the policies that now threaten the planet. So there could not be a better time to hear from our witnesses today. Let me turn and recognize uh, our first witness. Our first witness is Mr. Billy Parrish, the co-founder and coordinator of the Energy Action Coalition and one of the foremost young leaders of the environmental movement. Since founding the Energy Action Coalition, Mr. Parrish has helped to turn the idea of bringing colleges across the country together to improve our environment into a reality. Rolling Stone called Billy a climate hero and Mother Jones Magazine names Billy as the Student Activist of the Year. Uh, welcome, Mr. Parrish. Uh, whenever you are ready, please begin. Thank you, Chairman Markey, for inviting us here today. I want to also thank you and Speaker Pelosi for addressing power shift on Saturday night and for your leadership over the past 30 years on these critical issues. I want to finally recognize the thousands of young people today standing shoulder to shoulder for the largest climate lobby day in U.S. history. Remember, remember the 5th of November. <laughs> An unstoppable movement has taken root in every school and every community in this nation. A generation has come to Washington today to lead, to be heard, and to find allies in this Congress who are ready to do what is necessary to solve our climate crisis. My name is Billy Parrish, and I'm the coordinator of the Energy Action Coalition, a diverse alliance of 46 organizations working to support and strengthen the student and youth clean energy movement in the U.S. and Canada to create change for a clean, efficient, just, and renewable energy future. 
I have brought with me our coalition's youth statement of principles on climate and energy and other supporting documents for the congressional record. We come here today with three demands for Congress. One, create five million new jobs through a clean energy core to weatherize, solarize, rewire, and rebuild this country. Let's put people to work and create green pathways out of poverty. Yeah. Green jobs now! Green jobs now! Green jobs now! Green jobs now! <laughs> Two, cut carbon at least 80% by 2050, 30% 30 by 2020, and auction 100% of the pollution allowances from day one. Science tells us we can aim for nothing less. 80 by 50, 80 by 50, 80 by 50, 80 by 50. Three, pass an immediate moratorium on the construction of new coal plants. We should shift all federal subsidies from fossil fuels and nuclear to wind and solar and create a just transition for workers from the old economy into the new green economy. No coal. No new coal. No new coal. We will be heard because at 50 million strong, the millennial generation outnumbers even the baby boomers by 3 million and represents the single largest demographic age group in this country. Polling data, recent voter turnout, and the swelling ranks of increase, and increasing coordination of the youth climate movement all demonstrate that this young generation is engaged and ready to carry out a historic power shift. Youth turnout in the past two elections hit the highest level in at least 20 years and is only on the rise. We are not alone. Youth are assembling coalitions that are bringing together a diverse, and powerful set of allies, including unions, businesses, people of faith, farmers, civil rights groups, and many more. And we are not just here in DC. We are, we are in every congressional district in America, and we are organizing. Politicians would be wise to take note. Exactly one year from today, we will have a new Congress and a new president. You have one year to prove that you are worthy of being our representatives in this government. And if you don't, you will need to look for a new job as millions of young voters throw their support behind more progressive and pro-environment candidates committed to ending the climate crisis and protecting future generations. We will be heard because we are the ones that we have been waiting for. As the Bush administration and our federal government has done almost nothing for the last seven years, young people have organized and made change. Through the Campus Climate Challenge, tens of thousands of young people have engaged in the hard work of making their schools models of sustainability for the rest of society. In just the last year, 426 colleges have committed to becoming climate neutral, and more sign on every day. We are building partnerships with community groups to block the construction of new coal-fired power plants and launch a green wave of urban and rural renewal. As our government abandoned the people of New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, tens of thousands of young people dropped everything to serve and rebuild. Over 6,000 of us came to PowerShift this weekend. Thousands more took part in Step It Up across the country. We are a generation of solutions, but we know we cannot do it alone and have come to seek your help. And we will be heard because we are quite literally fighting for our lives. This can no longer be a political issue. For the survival of our people, and our planet, we must put aside partisan politics and come together as humans, as mothers and fathers, 
sisters and brothers, to heal ourselves and our planet. This is no small task. As Yvonne Peter told us on Saturday night, this is not only an ecological and economic crisis, it is a spiritual and cultural crisis that is centuries old. We must begin the long process of reconciliation with the original peoples of this land, with the people that were brought here against their will, especially those from Africa, and all the people who are poorly served by our society. We cannot sacrifice communities for our overconsumption today, not only because it is wrong for those communities today, but because we will be sacrificing the basis of life for our children and future generations. I'm 26 years old and about to become a father. I implore the members of this 110th Congress to hear our demands, but I ask that you hear them not only as politicians, but also as mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers. We can do this if we work together, but we must begin today. Green jobs now. Green jobs now. Green jobs now. Eighty by fifty. Eighty by fifty. Eighty by fifty. Eighty by fifty. No coal. No new coal. No new coal. Thank you. Our second witness is uh, Brittany Cochran. She originally from a small rural town in Louisiana. Our next witness, uh, Brittany Cochran, is now a junior at uh, Xavier University in New Orleans. After work with the Deep South Environmental Justice Center, Ms. Cochran became a leader in the environmental movement. Since then, she has become passionate about how the issues of global warming and energy dependence are affecting vulnerable communities like her home in Louisiana. For her leadership on environmental issues, Brittany was featured in Seventeen magazine. We welcome you, uh, Ms. Cochran. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Good morning. My name is Brittany Cochran, and I am a pharmacy student at Xavier University of Louisiana. I would like to thank this Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming for inviting me this morning to represent young environmentalists who are passionate about global warming. My personal experiences of growing up, living, and witnessing disproportionate effects of global warming will greatly influence my perspective and testimony. As a child, I listened as a woman who assumed the role as my grandmother accused petrochemical plants of polluting our environment. She blamed them for the death of her daughter, who died of breast cancer in her mid-30s. I watched her battle major companies and win. At that time, I did not realize I was inheriting an interest and awareness in environmental justice. As a young adult, I have decided to join the fight for a clean and just environment for all. Global warming is caused by the emission of heat-trapping gases produced by vehicles, power plants, industrial processes, and deforestation. In Louisiana, the effects of global warming are exacerbated by coastal erosion. Because of coastal erosion, there is no buffer system to prevent places inland like New Orleans from being flooded and washed away. 
Hurricanes Katrina and Rita washed away more than 200 square miles of coastal wetlands. Poor African American communities are the most vulnerable and are disproportionately impacted by these destructive hurricanes because they live in close proximity to industry. I have personally experienced the effects of living so close to industry. In 1999, an aluminum plant five miles from my home had an explosion that sent chemicals and products into the air and into our yards. In my lifetime, because of global warming, I will probably experience and witness many more catastrophic and unprecedented occurrences such as Hurricane Katrina, tsunamis, and other earthquakes. Environmental justice is about fighting for those disproportionately affected by global warming. For example, people of color, low income, and indigenous people are exposed to more air pollution in their communities and are less likely to have health and property insurance. Hurricane Katrina demonstrated how minorities and those affected disproportionately by global warming are most affected. Most of those areas occupied by African Americans in New Orleans are still vulnerable and are likely to be flooded in a major storm. These are the people who don't have the means or resources to evacuate, relocate, and put their lives back together. As a resident of New Orleans, Louisiana, a great city that bore the brunt of the effects of Hurricane Katrina, it is important that I am here to stress the fact that global warming is real and it's a hard reality for many people along the Gulf Coast. During Katrina, all of my family members that lived in the city lost everything. They lost their homes, jobs, and places of worship. And now, two years later, none of those families have moved back into their homes. I, too, personally have been affected because I lost all of my campus possessions and I was displaced from my city and my school. Many of my peers and colleagues still feel the effects of Katrina. Some are behind in their collegiate studies because the universities were closed for a semester. And upon reopening, a lot of the degree programs were discontinued because of lack of faculty members. We are faced with extreme increases in rent and living expenses, along with a decrease in job opportunities. Because of this, we are all impacted, both physically and mentally. As a young person, I feel it is my responsibility to work to combat the crisis of global warming. While working with the Deep South Center for Environmental Justice, I helped facilitate a seminar on global warming. I taught classes, and I introduced it to other youth who have since then committed to spreading the word. In 2004, I joined the Climate Justice Corps, which is a great group of young activists who work with communities and have, that have felt the impact of climate change. Together, we help them fight against political and industrial causes of climate change. While it is true, that only a select few are burdened more than others by pollution and environmental harm, global warming affects all races and the economy. Together, my generation can make a powerful impact on the future generations. There must be a radical change in our society, one that includes making global warming a priority so that we can solve the crisis before we reach a point of no return. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Ms. Uh, Charlie Lockwood, who exemplifies the efforts high school students are making around the country uh, to improve our climate and energy future. From St. Michael Village in Alaska, Ms. Lockwood has taken a leadership role in her community on environmental issues. She has traveled the state of Alaska giving climate change presentations to her peers and gathering signatures, demanding action on issues of global warming. For all of her work, Ms. Lockwood received the Alaska Conservation Foundation uh, Denny uh, Wilcher Award for Outstanding High School Activism. Uh, we welcome you, Ms. Lockwood. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Thank you. Um, first of all, I would like to thank 
uh, you for being here to hear this emergency that we are all facing today. And I'd also like to thank the Power Shift people for being here to support us. Um, my name is Duntuvak, which means moose in Yupik Eskimo language. And my English name is Charlie Lockwood. Um, my mom and dad are Rosina and Charles Lockwood. I have four brothers and two sisters, 20 nieces and nephews. I graduated from a public boarding school in 2007. Um, I grew up in uh, St. Michael where there's 400 people in the village and I grew up going fish camp and um, doing a lot of cultural activities. Um, I also was brought up by a bunch of my elders, which they taught me to respect others the way I want to be treated, and also how to live off subsistence. And hopefully someday I get to teach that to my children and my grandchildren. Um, the global warming ex effects that I have experienced personally is coastal erosion, where my family's houses are falling into the bay, and um, also the graveyards that we have, like the Russian Orthodox, Orthodox graveyards are also falling into the bay, and it's where all of our um, our whole family goes and plays, and also <coughs> it's really dangerous. But um, we've also been having decreasing in subsistence food, like our moose, our fishing, our just seals and whales, all the native foods that we eat off the land. Um, the berry picking spots that we go every single year are not there anymore. The hunters are more in danger in the winter time because they go out on the ice and a lot of them have fallen through. Um, um, new Take your time. Take your time. <laughs> um, just through my lifetime, I've seen so many, um, changes in our community that it just hurts to not be able to have our, it's really scary to lo lose our tradition, our, our culture. And we've been living here for thousands of years. And it's not just that we're losing our food, it's losing our homes and because we are spiritually connected and emotionally and physically connected to our homes and there are so many so many communities that are in trouble it's an emergency we need to take action now because um, I don't know if you've heard about the Shishmaraf their, their, their whole community has to move and it's taken so much money just to relocate 500 people, and we need to take action now. Um, it, this is, is going to impact my future, all of our futures, because we'd have to leave our homes, our tradition, our, where our ancestors taught us how to take care of our, ourselves from from traditional culture lifestyles. Um, 
And because there's no good, there's going to be nobody else to teach what we've learned from our elders. I'm, I'm in a group called Alaska Youth for Environmental Action, and I'd like the Alaska Youth for Environmental Action to stand up. Alaska Youth for Environmental Action's mission is to inspire, educate, and take action on global warming effects in Alaska. And they've done so much to encourage people to raise their voice and get a lot of things done in Alaska that to help each other out. Um, We've collected 5,000 signatures from all over Alaska, high school students just going around and doing presentations on worrying about global warming or worrying others about global warming and how it's affecting us now and how it could affect us in our future. We brought the signatures to our um, congressional legislators to show how much this is an emergency. And we've also did a three, two, one pledge to show people that they can do what they can do as individuals to reduce carbon emissions to slow down climate change. And the three, what the three, two, one pledge is, is you just change three um, of your light bulbs to, um, her, what was it? Again, light fluorescent light bulbs, and you turn your your house degree two two degrees down in the winter time, and you unplug one appliance in uh, in your house, and these are just like really simple things that could really get us so far if we all just like did everything as a group, and. Um, we, most of us that, that I've met in the whole group, there's seven chapters in Alaska right now. And what I've mostly heard is to save our values, such as clean water, clean air, our homes, our cultures, and most importantly, our future. Um, Um, we've gone through a lot to get try to get support from our leaders, which is everybody. Yeah, like our senators, our representatives, and we need your help now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Ms. Lockwood. And our next uh, witness um, is uh, Caitlin McCormick, who is a student at the University of Tennessee and an officer in Students Promoting Environmental Action in Knoxville called SPEAK. SPEAK has been involved in initiating and promoting renewable energy policies on campus, and including a comprehensive energy plan a purchase of 
506 megawatts of renewable energy a year and a green building certification policy. Caitlin is also an organizer of Focus the Nation, which is a national teach-in on global warming solutions for America taking place on January 31st. Welcome, Caitlin. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Good morning. My name is Caitlin McCormick and I am a student at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. First, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for having me speak here today. Not many people who are willing to stand up for what they believe in have an opportunity to speak out for those beliefs. I am fortunate enough to be able to share my experiences here today. I am here now for justice because lately I have seen many unjust things. In early October, I had the privilege to visit a town in West Virginia with many other students. We visited one of the many areas of Appalachia where the destructive practice of mountaintop removal coal mining is taking over and rapidly deteriorating an entire region. Standing at the top of Cayford Mountain, I looked down at what was once lush forest, a home for many creatures, a playground for people, what was once a majestic mountaintop, and I felt a knot form in my stomach. I overheard someone from our group relate seeing this barren mountain to seeing a person's broken bone exposed, and I suddenly understood the sickness I was feeling. This was not something any of us were meant to see. My heart was heavy, and I was overwhelmed. However, this was nothing compared to the sadness I would feel when a little girl whose elementary school built 300 feet away from a coal processing plant and directly below a dam containing tons of coal slurry would look up at me and say, all of us kids are getting sick, but they won't build us a new school. It was nothing compared to what I felt when I listened to families tell me they suffer chronic illnesses because every breath they take is tainted by pollution. But even worse, it was nothing to how I felt when I saw the red polluted water that runs from the tap. How is anyone supposed to live without clean water? Who is letting this happen? An entire region is being disregarded because the rest of our nation is dependent on coal. Not only is this environmentally unjust, it is socially unjust. We all have a right to turn on that light switch, but we have a right to use these everyday commodities without worrying that by doing so, we are putting someone else's life in peril. As Americans, it is our civic responsibility to respect our people and our land. It is our civic responsibility to take care of our nation. But as human beings, it is our moral responsibility to be just and fair. Standing here today, I feel like a child telling her father that someone has been unfair and asking him to make it better. I shouldn't have to tell anyone that our actions are unfair. As a nation, we should always be striving for fairness, working to right our wrongs. Instead, we are creating more problems and more injustices. It is apparent that I am not the only person who feels this way. There is a movement happening. Youth everywhere are recognizing our world's energy crisis, and we are stepping up to fix it. Students across the United States have been working on sustainable initiatives for their campuses. Campus Climate Challenge has united 300 universities to work on 100% clean energy policies and progress towards sustainable alternatives. Frustrated that our government won't recognize the crisis we are facing, as youth we are stepping up to make positive change where we can, starting with sustainable campuses and moving up from there. This weekend has been monumental. Over 5,000 students have traveled here today to work towards a just energy future. We are all here for the same reasons, with the same goal in mind. And for the first time, we have been able to unite, learn, teach, share, and construct numerous methods to initiate and implement sustainability. On our campuses, in our communities, and across our nation. 
PowerShift is giving thousands of students the knowledge and resources necessary to implement these changes and continue to empower other students. This coming January, more than a thousand universities will simultaneously educate hundreds of thousands of students on solutions to global warming during the first ever Focus the Nation event. This event will be the biggest national teach-in in U.S. history. Educating and developing thousands of young leaders on solutions to global warming, Focus the Nation will be critical to the start of 2008. Unique to this event, Focus the Nation will connect faculty and students to build a better future together, bridging a generational gap that has not been connected since the civil rights movement of the 60s. Something big is happening. Our generation has realized the challenge ahead and we are stepping up to the plate. The movement is here, it is now, and the youth won't back down until our voice is acknowledged and action is taken. I care because this is my future. This is the future of my children, the future of our home, our health, our happiness. I care because if I don't, who will? This is why we all care. We will not sit by and watch as the place we love, the place we call home, is driven into the ground. Today I'm asking you to recognize what is happening. This movement is big and it will not dissipate. We don't want to be dependent on unrenewable resources. We don't want to oppress any more communities. We have made our voices clear, and we are continuously striving to become louder than ever. It's time our government take action and join us. Thank you. Great, and our final witness is Mr. Uh, Mike Regan, who is a student at UC Davis and the statewide board chair of CalPERG for students. As a board member, as a board member of CalPERG, Mr. Regan has coordinated campaigns to fight global warming across the state. On campus, he has led the student uh, lead efforts, calling for a larger investment in renewable energy at his school. Recently, Mr. Regan gra uh, gathered over 170,000 people to advocate for uh, more clean energy and funding for public transportation. We welcome you, Mr. Regan. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you, Chairman Markey, uh, and thank you to the Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming for allowing us to speak. Uh, my name is Mike Regan. I am here to represent the CalPERG student chapters as the statewide board chair but I also represent the student body at University of California at Davis, and I represent my entire generation of young people. I'm calling on Congress to take urgent action on global warming by passing the energy bill as a down payment on our future. To solve global warming, Congress must make the hard decisions that will change our relationship to energy, consumption, and sustainability. So far, Congress has not acted. In contrast, I have spent the last several years of my life organizing for the change I think we desperately need. And I'm not alone in taking this issue into my own hands. Governments at the state level and students like myself across the country are moving forward. We are not waiting for leadership from Congress. Instead, we are engaging in the fight. Our generation has been lost in the shuffle of the political game. And it will be our generation who will shoulder the brunt of a growing crisis. We understand the devastating effects of global warming because we have the most to lose. But in the face of federal inaction, 
on the most critical issue facing our generation today, we have grown cynical. We generally distrust government to solve our problems, so we are not surprised that neither Congress nor the White House is leading the effort to solve global warming. Additionally, we are brought up in a culture of blockbuster news focused on grabbing the short attention spans of Americans. As a result, many of the youth generation are unsure of the problems that the solutions that exist to this problem. So you would think that our generation would be immobilized, saddled with cynicism of, with our leaders and despair that our problem cannot be solved. But in fact, the opposite is true. As a student leader, I have decided to work where I have the greatest impact uh, and building a base of engaged students who focus on policy solutions. At UC Davis and in my community, I have worked to get students politically active and it's proving to work. Recently, I organized students' voices to urge our school to build more sustainable buildings on campus, including persuading our administration to fund a building with student dollars, which is now qualified as one of the greenest buildings in the world. We have switched in 5,000 energy efficient light bulbs in the last few weeks. And we've promoted energy efficiency and conservation with solar smoothies, uh, making banana shakes with the power of the sun. And film screenings of Inconvenient Truth have been overwhelmingly popular on college campuses across the country. Across the state, my organization, CalPERG, has led efforts in UC Santa Cruz for a student referendum to run the university on 100% renewable energy. At UC Berkeley and UC Santa Barbara, we created, collect we created collective student funds to spur sustainable projects on campus. And so far this school year, we've educated over 34,000 students in California on the solutions to global warming through clean car, clean car shows, lights out dorm contests, and much, much more. At the statewide level, we have campaigned to urge our political leaders to make the hard decisions. In 2005, I personally raised over $6,000 for Environment California to pass the Million Solar Roofs Bill, which is the largest investment of solar power in the history of the world. In the summer of 2006, I raised over $8,000 for Environment California to pass the Global Warming Solutions Act, the biggest step this nation has taken to fight global warming so far. And thousands of students as campus activists and canvassers were on the front lines building support for these policy reforms. From these examples, you can see that young people like myself are seeing the solutions in acting. In state capitals, change is taking place as well. Now over 5,000 students from across the country have gathered together for universal change at the University of Maryland this weekend. You can only anticipate more. Therefore, today I urge Congress to act against global warming. Specifically, Congress should pass the energy bill this session. Congress should mandate 15% of our electricity to come from clean, renewable sources by 2020, as well as raise the average mile per gallon from cars and trucks to 35 by 2020. Such, a, such action will be recognized as a down payment on our clean future. It will allay our cynicism and renew our sense that Congress wants to lead our country into the future that my generation will inherit. On behalf of myself, the students at UC Davis, and on behalf of students across the country and my entire generation, I implore you not only to act by passing the energy bill of the session, I implore you to keep taking the necessary strides it will take to lead us off our unsustainable path onto a new, more promising, healthier future. Thank you, Chairman Markey, and thank you for the committee. Thank you, Mr. Regan, very much. And um, that completes time for the opening statements from our witnesses. Um, 
Mr. Parrish, you are one of the um, founding fathers of the youth movement calling for action on global warming. Can you uh, tell us how this movement has changed and grown over the last five years? What has happened? In only a few years, this movement has gone from a handful of, of student groups on college campuses around the country to student groups on over a thousand schools across the campus. And you know, we were starting with trying to pass 10 percent clean energy policies on our campuses. And in this past year, we have passed 426 climate neutrality policies on our campus. So we have seen the interest and the conviction get much deeper. We have seen the support across our generation get much broader. And we have seen tremendous victories from you know, education to policy. So what is it about the green movement that is attracting so many young people? You know, we know that our future is on the line. And it is you know, not only about the environment. It is about our economy. It is about this war. It is about our health. It is about our future. So you know, young people want to be part of something bigger than themselves. Our society has not encouraged us to build solidarity and to be part of our communities. It has encouraged uh, an individualism and uh, consumerism that has divided us for too long. Our generation is coming together around this issue as a unifying force and a positive vision for this country and for the world. Okay, you know what I think would be helpful is if you could talk a little bit about uh, the green job uh, potential and where you see those jobs being created and how it can affect uh, your generation in terms of where they work for uh, their time here uh, on the planet. Great. One of the uh, documents that I'm submitting for the congressional record <coughs> is the call for a national clean energy core which outlines a $200 billion ask for Congress, which sounds like a lot, but uh, actually isn't. Uh, the, the Clean Energy Corps would more than pay for itself in the energy cost savings that it would generate. We want to put $10 billion into doubling opportunities for national service around energy efficiency and climate. We want $50 billion for state and local green jobs development to train people in the skills that they need to weatherize homes, to put up solar panels, to expand green space, and do a number of other activities that help build community and solve global warming. And finally, we want $140 billion for a revolving loan fund to finance energy efficiency projects around the country. We want those jobs to go to the people that have been locked out of the old, dirty economy, and we want to give them pathways out of poverty into the new green economy. Great. We want them to go to underserved communities. We want them to go to uh, <coughs> veterans from the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and around the world. We want them to go to workers that are losing their jobs because of manufacturing leaving or to create a just transition for workers uh, in dirty industries in this country. Thank you. Uh, well, Ms. Cochran, can, can you talk a little bit about um, the uh, community in New Orleans and the jobs that were lost and the uh, impact of Katrina and uh, how you see this green revolution uh, benefiting uh, that community? I mean, it is an illustration of the intensity of the storms that are now um, hitting all parts of the globe and the impacts that it has, especially upon the poorest people who are most vulnerable? Um, New Orleans has changed a bit since Hurricane Katrina. Um, we have made a lot of progress and we, there are still some ways to go. Um, a lot of the city, a lot of the tourist areas of the city has come back. But there are still parts of New Orleans that look the same way it did two years ago. 
As far as jobs loss, a whole community in New Orleans East is still struggling to come back. There were lots of stores, shopping centers, um, different schools that have not reopened, which a lot of jobs are lost, which caused people to relocate. I know a lot of people in New Orleans still have trouble just rebuilding their homes because the resources aren't available. A store just like Home Depot that one was once opened is closed and you have to travel so far just to get the materials needed to put your lives back together. Um, as far as the progress in New Orleans, the way it affects me, I know personally at my university and other universities in the cities, a lot of the de degree programs have been discontinued because a lot of the faculty members and staff have relocated because they can't put their lives back together there in the city. Um, a lot of new programs have started. I participated in the Safe Way Back Home program with the Deep South Center for Environmental Justice. And with that program, what we did, we um, took a block in New Orleans East. We dug up the whole lawn. We resodded it. We put new grass, new landscaping as an incentive to get people to come back as an incentive to make the community look like it still has life. And, um, you know, it makes people want to say, you know, this is my home. You know, it's, it doesn't matter if your inside is fixed, but if the block looks like it did the day after Hurricane Katrina, it's not an incentive for people to come back. Another program that's um, about to start is they're offering training and a grant with HUD, Healthy Homes Project. And people are getting trained in environmentally safe renovations and remodeling. Um, work practices, and it includes information on ro mold remediation, soil remediation, and learning efficient ways to conserve energy in the home. And the next training would be November 17th. So like we're starting different things to get people to come back, and just in case another hurricane happens, we'll know how to recover quick, quicker. Um, so I, I think New Orleans is gonna come back. I think it's gonna take some time, but with help from Congress and other youth leaders, I think we can do it. Great, thank you. Now, Ms. Lockwood, you were talking about uh, Shishmaref. You made a mention of Shishmaref. Um, how many other communities in Alaska are in the same position? That is that they are vulnerable as well to the effects of climate change and the impact on that village. and in the same way that tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars are going to have to be spent to relocate Shishmaref and the people who live there. Could it happen in other parts of Alaska as well? Yes, it can because um, there are so many communities that live on the coast of all over Alaska, like all the coastal areas, and everybody depends on fish, and um, it it would take a lot of money just to move a place of 500 people, and that's that doesn't even seem worth it. I mean, it's happened to one community, and um, my. My guess is there's over a hundred other communities that need, are in need of help of um, coastal erosions. And it, for my community, um, we do not have enough money from our um, corporations or just like we don't even have any funding from anywhere to help our our own community. So, yeah. Thank you, um, Mr. Regan. You um, you were talking about raising the fuel economy standard from 25 miles per gallon to 35 miles per gallon, and having 15 percent of all of our electricity come from wind and solar by 2020. Um, do you think that the young people are ready to rally behind that over the next four or five weeks? We're we're ready to we're go, we're going to be yes yes. 
Yes, I do. Um, <laughs> Billy spoke very eloquently of how the movement changed a lot in the last few years. Uh, we focused on mobilizing our generation, speaking, it to them, speaking to them where, where we're at. And like I said in my testimony, our generation will bear the brunt of this assault on the earth. And we have been calling out in a very unified voice for change on our college campuses, with our state and local governments. The only institution that has been slow to listen has been Congress so far. And that's why there are so many people gathered here today uh, to advocate for change. And I feel that, that is proof that this generation can rally around this. Turn. There were over 5,000 people, students, this weekend in the University of Maryland rallying around this one issue and thousands other around the country in their own events on their college campuses. Well, I, I thank you, you know, um, and, and, uh, and I appreciate the, um, the three-point program as, as well that Mr. Parrish laid out for us. Um, but those two numbers that I just mentioned, and that you me mentioned, Mr. Regan, in your testimony, those are two important numbers too, 35 and 15. 35 miles per gallon for all vehicles, 15 percent of all renewable, uh, all uh, electricity coming from renewables, both by 2020, just 12 years from now. Huh? Uh, and that would, that would just trigger this revolution just in those two areas. So 35 and 15 are key numbers. Um, and we are going to be voting on those two numbers in the next four to five weeks here in Congress. Uh, and it will be the most important change that um, has happened in since I, I was elected to Congress 31 years ago, and it will be the most important vote that we've had on energy and environment in 31 years. Um, and if we win that, as you said in your testimony, Mr. Regan, that will be the building block. That will be the first step. And then we can move on uh, to a cap and auction and trade bill uh, that uh, will limit uh, by 80 percent the greenhouse gases by 2050 that we can do next year. But we have to win this first one. We have to prove that we can win on 35-15. We have to prove that we, can, um, that we can push that through and put it on President Bush's desk. Uh, uh, and uh, that will be a big opportunity for us because it will happen right around the time that the world is meeting in Bali uh, and that Al Gore is going to Oslo to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, so all of it will be happening right at the same time. So we are going to need your energy, your efforts in order to be able to uh, be successful on that vote. It is coming up right now. It's not, you don't have to wait for the election in 2008. There is something big happening here in Congress uh, in the next four to five weeks, and we are going to need your help on that as well. Ms. McCormick, um, you um, you are down in Tennessee. You are talking about the coal um, uh, issue. Um, how is the renewable electric, how is the renewable um, issue being received down in Tennessee? Well, a lot of people support it, but in these regions there are a lot of underprivileged families that don't realize what change can do for them. And if we could just have the support of our government to implement these changes and make a switch over to renewable energies and have a smooth transition from the dirty industry that is there now that is hurting them, but they rely on these industries to be there. This is how they support themselves. This is how they put food on their table. And they are scared that if we are talking about switching, they are going to lose their jobs. But that is not the case if we can have your support, because we can make a smooth transition and get this dirty industry out of this region. So and what, what success have you already seen at your own school in terms of um, changing the way um, your own school views these issues? Our school feels very strongly about these issues. We have taken many polls and the general student population there has voted to implement an increase in their own tuition to raise their own tuition prices to ensure that our campus is not purchasing the, this coal that is coming from this region. We care very much about this region and we see directly the changes that it is having and the number of people that it is affecting. And 
we are in full support of this. How much have you increased your tuition in order to, in order to effectuate uh, the green revolution on your campus? For in-state tuition, it's like a $20 increase, and for out-of-state, it's just a little more. And then what did you do with that money? That money goes to um, a, a committee that allocates funding for um, renewable energy on campus. We have a responsible coal purchasing policy and that money is funding that. And we have a certain amount set aside for other projects. Um, and uh, do any of the others of you have on your own campus um, fees on the student body that is then used for renewable um, energy purposes? How many people out there are on campuses that have a renewable energy fund that uh, that's great. That's a phenomenal revolution because you're the leaders uh, in your own community and, and then a, giving illustrations as to how this uh, can work for um, everyone to create new jobs. Because as you're doing these projects, you're creating jobs for people who have to then from the community come in to construct these uh, facilities. Um, Mr. Parrish, um, this is a movement um, that uh, is not only here in the United States. You made reference to it around the world. Could you elaborate on that? There, there are young people that came to power shift from at least half a dozen countries around the world. But more importantly, there are youth networks that have emerged and are emerging all over the world and have rallied around very similar strategies and goals for their work. We are um, working you know, first and as our core focus to make our own schools and our own communities models of the sustainable future and society that we want to see. But we are also rallying around building an international framework for uh, reducing emissions globally uh, at the scale of the problem. I also want to add that as young people, you know, we are coming here today as a youth movement seeking partnership with our parents' generation, our grandparents' generation. We don't want a divided movement. We don't want to, to be only a youth movement. We want a you know, national mobilization on this issue. So you know, we come here calling on our parents and our grandparents to join us in this fight for our future. And Mr. Parrish, what is your message to the corporations who are fighting this clean energy movement, this clean environment movement? What do you say to those corporations who are fighting you and this movement? I say they're going down. <laughs> Young people are very, very savvy on these issues. They, they know greenwashing when they see it. They don't want to buy from companies that aren't uh, you know, attentive to you know, the sustainability of this planet. They want to work for, invest in, and buy products from companies that really are uh, trying to, to do things in a sustainable way. They are starting their own businesses to replace the businesses of the past that are not attentive to these concerns. Okay, you know, um, I think maybe what we could do is ask each of you, if you would, um, to uh, give us your best one minute. What is the one minute you want Congress to remember uh, about your movement and the change that you want to see for our country? Uh, and for our planet. Um, and we'll go in reverse order. And we'll begin with you, Mr. Regan, if you could. Give us, give us the message you want the Congress to remember. I'd be happy to. Uh, my message is that students across the country have been acting for change for years. They've been advocating on their campuses. They've been advocating in their governments locally and statewide to solve a problem that's going to affect our generation more than any other and to solve a problem that is 
devastating. The effects of global warming are so tremendous when the solutions are so simple. And now it's time for Congress to act. Now it's time to get on board and make the changes, take the tough decisions that it will take to lead us on a cleaner energy future and to a brighter path and ensure that government is for the people and not for, as Billy said, uh, corporations and the corporate community. Thank you, Mr. Reagan. Uh, Ms. McCormick. I would like to say to Congress that it is not just our youth that are waking up. People across our nation are waking up and unifying to send the same message to Congress that we no longer support unrenewable resources and we want to put the energy, the money, and the work into starting new and reusable sources of energy. And I would just like to say that this movement is not going to stop, and if Congress won't listen, we'll just be here knocking on the door even longer. Thank you. Yep. Ms. Cochran. Um, I just want to remind Congress um, that I'm here to represent ordinary people. Global warming, hap the effects of global warming happens every day. Even after the TV cameras go off, after the flashes stop flashing, the news stop reporting about it, ordinary people feel the effects of global warming every day. So it's very important that we do policy changes now that affect our future when it's not the headlines of the news. Um, it's very important that we feel safe in our communities, that we can breathe clean air, we have clean jobs, and support renewable energy. Thank you, Ms. Cochran. <laughs> Ms. Lockwood. I would. Uh like to ask as an individual and as a representative of my future, my generation, and Elva, Alaska, for the Congress to open up their hearts and their ears and to be a good support, a good buddy, a good friend, a good anything, like a good somebody to us and help us out for saving our values. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Lockwood. I want Congress to put partisan politics aside for one moment. I want Congress to um, to understand that you know their future, their children's future, and future generations' lives are truly at stake. And we have a very, very small window of time to change the direction of our culture and our economy to move it in a more sustainable direction. Thank you, Mr. Parrish, and, and we thank uh, each of you. Um, again, we have, uh, I think we have a great chance um, in, um, uh, before the next election, before the election of 2008, uh, to pass um, a climate change bill, to pass a cap and auction and trade bill. 
uh, which will uh, lead to the reduction by 80 percent of the greenhouse gases which uh, we emit uh, on this planet by the year 2050. But the test vote on that is going to be here in Congress uh, over uh, the next four to five weeks. And that will be the vote on 3515. Because if we can't increase renewable electricity by 15 percent by 2020, if we can't increase the fuel economy standard of the vehicles that we drive to 35 miles per gallon by 2020, then we will not have seen the progress which we need politically uh, in order to build the momentum towards uh, reducing by 80 percent the greenhouse gases by the year 2050. So we have to win first here uh, over the next four to five weeks and then before the next election have the big vote on the 80 percent reduction by the year 2050. But it won't happen uh, without you. It won't happen without your efforts. Uh, it won't happen without the energy that you can bring to this issue over the next four to five weeks. Uh, this is the moment. This is the time. This is the place. Um, never before have so many people been in the Ways and Means Committee room at the same time. You are, you are absolutely the biggest crowd of people. This is the largest, this is the largest audience for a uh, for a committee hearing in the history of Congress. And you are in the room right now as we are having it. And it is a whole generation which is rising and speaking uh, on these issues. And as Billy said, you are the largest generation. You are speaking for the 21st century. You are testifying on behalf of the 21st century. You are testifying on behalf of the future of the planet, of the poor people on the planet, of the of the, of the whole vision of what this planet can be. And so we need your help, your work over the next uh, four to five weeks on this bill uh, that is the first step uh, that will lead to the much larger step of an 80 percent reduction by 2050. Uh, we can't thank each and every one of you enough for the excellent testimony uh, which you gave today. Uh, with the thanks of the committee, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you all so, so much. The Senate meets today at 2 Eastern. They will begin with general speeches before turning to the Farm Bill, setting agriculture policy for the next five years. It also includes nutrition programs such as food stamps and conservation projects. Live coverage here on C-SPAN 2. The House also meets for legislative work at 2 Eastern, today funding for tuberculosis, and a bill aimed at protecting the credit ratings of military service members. Live House coverage is on C-SPAN. Congressional negotiators are meeting this week to work out House Senate compromises on federal spending. And today, appropriations.